Hi, everyone. Welcome back. I hope you're having a great weekend. If you're listening to this on Saturday when this episode debuts, if you want to follow along with today's Cabral house call questions, head on over to stephencabral.com forward slash 1870. You'll be able to read along with the questions right there. If you're new to the show, welcome. It's great to have you. I know there's so many new people coming into the community, which is great. Every single Saturday, every single Sunday, every year, we go through all of your questions. So if you have a question, you're welcome to write in at Ask Cabral. And what I do is I answer those questions in the order that they come in. So we're typically six weeks or so behind, and the first questions coming in today are from the end of January 2021. So always happy again to do my part to be able to provide you with a second opinion, maybe an alternative source of information, as they say, from conventional medicine. And of course, it will always be based on 20 years of practice, uh, well over a quarter million uh, wellness client and uh, health health fitness, all those client appointments as of right now. So again, just love being able to be a resource for you. What I can't do is provide you with medical advice. Just always keep that in mind. Not giving you medical advice. I can't act as your primary care physician. uh, So this is not for a diagnosis or a treatment-based protocol. But besides that, having said all that, what we can do is we can help you how we've helped the hundreds of thousands of other people be able to figure out the underlying root cause of their issue, whether it be health or weight or aging, and be able to rectify that by rebalancing the underlying root cause. So away we go. The first question today is from Savannah. Savannah writes in and says, Hi, Dr. Rawl. I have a question about cold stasis. I was diagnosed with my first pregnancy and induced early. I'm pregnant again, and I'm hoping I will not have it again. I can't find much information about how to prevent it or treat without drugs. I did three of your liver detoxes last year, and I'm hoping that will make a difference this pregnancy. Any suggestions you have to maintain a healthy liver during pregnancy? I've heard about maybe taking activated charcoal. Any tips or resources for more info would be great. Thank you. All right, so I would give you different advice if you weren't already pregnant again. So if you weren't already pregnant again, I would have you do, you already did your functional medicine detoxes, which is great, but I would have you do a liver and gallbladder cleanse. If you don't know what that is, you can just go to literally, go to stephencabral.com forward slash podcast. That's where all the 1869 other podcasts are. And you can use the search box and you can just type in gallbladder cleanse or uh, liver and gallbladder cleanse. And you'll get the cheat sheet, the one page instruction sheet on that and exactly how to do it. I mean, there's really not a lot to it, and it's been used now for thousands of years. Uh, Typically, people will do it multiple times, maybe three, maybe four, once a month. And so that's what I would do if you weren't pregnant. But since you are pregnant, I'd be very careful with using things like charcoal on a daily basis just because charcoal in and of itself contains quite a bit carcinogens. Remember, it's burnt, right? It's burnt coconut hulls or whatever they decide to use. So I'm not a huge advocate of using charcoal all the time. We use charcoal in my practice during the intestinal cleanse, no doubt about it. It's a great product. And of course, if you ever get food poisoning, sick to your stomach, et cetera, you always have some activated charcoal and or bentonite clay on hand. I just always have our uh, intestinal cleanse products right on hand. So that's that. But what to do if you are pregnant? Well... Being able to do some natural things is always helpful. And you have to think about what keeps the liver bile flowing. So anybody who don't know, who doesn't know what we're speaking about, we're talking about essentially a blockage of bile in the liver. So what we want to do is how do we keep the liver moving? Lots of water, lots of hydration. Of course, we know that, right? But let's let's talk about it even more because your body, when you're pregnant, produces more blood volume, which means you can't drink the same amount of water that you used to. You need to drink water more fluid. Okay. So we know we need more fluid and being able to drink some nice uh, green juices with a little bit of beet juice, not too much, but a little beet juice could be very beneficial. Um, which, which is quite nice for the body as well, keeps the bile flowing. And also not juicing your fruit, never juice your fruit, eat your fruit. And I would recommend one apple, maybe even two per day. And that could help as well with the malic acid to keep that bile flowing too. So again, not a treatment protocol, but those things have been working for many thousands of years and, and I hope they do you well uh, as well. Christine is up next. Hi, Dr. Brawl. I'm loving this world of information you've created and grateful for it. I have a question about my 11-year-old daughter. She seems to have a bit of contact dermatitis around her mouth. It looks like small patches of itchy, tiny red bumps on the side of her nose in the corners of her month. 
mouth. I apologize that I'm having difficulty reading today. It's not you. It's me. We're careful not to use steroid creams and want a more natural way to clear this up. Any insight would be great. Thanks for all you do. Okay. So I've seen uh, many, 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 many children in my practice, uh, and I love working with kids. The biggest reason we see for little red bumps are on the face, the cheeks, and around the month, mouth is due to food sensitivities. It can be an IgE, IgA sensitivity, or a latent IgG, which would be a day or two later. What can you do? There's a couple things you can do. The free way is keep a food journal. Every time those little red bumps pop up, you say, huh, what did my child eat today? Maybe even yesterday. And you can use what's called a rotation diet to be able to make this easier for you. Just go to stephencabral.com forward slash podcast and type in rotation diet. There's a free show on it. And of course, if you ever can not find a podcast, just go to cabralsupportgroup.com. That's our free Facebook group. And you can just ask right there. And Michelle, and other great helpful people and coaches will be able to direct you in the right direction. Okay, so journal is one. Number two is we run a food sensitivity test. Number three, we can run a candida metabolic and vitamins test for digestive-based issues as well as yeast, fungal overgrowth. And the third could be a bacteria and parasite stool test. That's the order that I would do them in for a child. And, uh, and again, use that food journal. So that's typically where I see it the most, okay? There are other factors, but 80% of the time, it's from food. Okay. Uh, or food-based byproducts, for example. Pesticides on food uh, is a big one. Patty's up next. Hi, Dr. Brawl. Thank you so much in advance for answering my three questions. I'm a 35-year-old woman. I eat a vegetarian diet. I get very tired before I get my period. And I'm wondering if you have any thoughts on how to combat this. I also get breast pain. I get headaches very frequently. Sometimes I will just feel what I call kind of background headaches where it's not horrible, but I feel like it's on the brink of getting bad. Sometimes the base of my skull on the right side and left side will be tender. Do you think it could be tension-related headaches, or is there something I should do or look for in order to be able to figure it out? I've always, number three, I have always been a night owl. Sometimes it seems the more I fight it, the hotter it makes my life. I'm an artist and I work for myself. Is there a problem with going to bed at 3 a.m. and waking up at 11? I don't want to cause my body unnecessary stress, but sometimes I think this is just the way I am and should accept it and not be too harsh myself. Thank you for any help that you can give. Okay, Patty, I'm happy to answer all of these questions for you. So let's see if I can just, I mean, the sleep one is easy. It's easy, and I've talked about it many, many times on the podcast, so you sound like you might be a new listener to the show. So what I want you to do is just go to stephencabral.com forward slash podcast, scroll through all the images at the top, whether you're on your phone or desktop. Look for the category on sleep. You'll find about two dozen shows just on sleep, and that will help you rewire your brain and chemistry to get to bed earlier. It actually does make a difference in the long run if you go to bed at three and wake up at 11. Even though you get eight hours, it throws off your hormones, and you are dealing with hormone-based issues. No doubt about it, 35 years old, let's, let's forget the vegetarian diet. You could be on a great vegetarian diet, so let's not blame it on the vegetarian diet. Let's blame it on stress, because you mentioned there's a little stress there, and a dysfunctional diurnal rhythm, which means that you're waking up at least three hours too late, and you're going to bed at least four hours too late. So when we look at this, what can happen? Well, your thyroid is meant to be really functioning at, at high capacity, 3, 4 a.m. in the morning. Your adrenals begin to really turn on and produce more cortisol around 6 a.m. to 8 a.m., which they're producing their peak of cortisol there. All of these things, in a way, affect your estrogen levels and progesterone levels. You sound like someone that's having, uh, we'll call it luteal phase dysfunction, which means that during the last 14 days of your cycle, you are, because you, you say you're getting tired before your period and you're getting headaches. These are all normal. Uh, they're not normal, right? But they're common dysfunctions of being estrogen dominant. So I have a podcast and I also have, well, the best thing for you would be to, to actually take the female hormones rebalancing health results accelerator. That's at stephencabral.com forward slash courses. And you can find it right there. And, and that will literally give you every answer you need on how to rebalance your female hormones. If you don't want to do that, or if you want to do that along with a lab test, that's the best of all worlds. So you can find that lab test right on that page as well for the female hormones um, health results accelerator. 
Or you can run what's called the stress hormones, mood, and metabolism test. That will look at your sleep-based pattern, your cortisol, your estrogen, your progesterone, your testosterone, DHEA, uh, your thyroid hormones, and your blood sugar. So all of this gives you the total picture because it certainly sounds like you have this dysfunctional diurnal rhythm, sleeping and waking, and you also have a difficulty getting to bed earlier, but you also have an a, uh, imbalance in hormones. So again, Best of all worlds, take the Health Results Accelerator. Along with that lab test, you get a nice little discount by doing them both together. Then you'll also get a plan with that lab customized for you. So hopefully that's helpful. All right, T is up next. You are a brilliant, amazing, and incredible Dr. Cabral. Well, I appreciate that. Thank you very much, T. Uh, can mycophenolic acid through a cord blood umbilical stem cell a IV don't exactly, let me, let me read the whole thing. After I did this, I developed mast cell activation. Can you please do a podcast on mycophenolic acid? I'm done to four, I've done four organic acids foods due to reacting with histamine and mast cell, brain fog, limbic system, and sense of smell has heightened and fatigue. Please help. Okay. I'm going to pull all this together. So mycophenolic acid is essentially a, an immunosuppressant and it can, it can come from mold. So I'm going to pull this all together. And it says that you got it through stem cell IV therapy. And after you did that, you got mast cell activation syndrome, which is basically like a lot of histamine-based reactions. Okay, so you're trying to figure out your histamines and mast cells. Okay, so let's figure this out. You've done a lot of the organic acids tests. That's great. That's called our candida vitamin and metabolic test. Okay. Now we need to run what's called a mold toxicity test. If you've already done that, then great. We are, again, I can't give you a treatment protocol, but what we would do and what I would do for myself is I would do the CBO protocol. First, I would do a functional medicine detox of 21 days if you can. Then I would do the CBO protocol. Then I would do an intestinal cleanse or sometimes during that. And then I would do the mold toxicity protocol. That's what I would do. And I would follow a lower histamine diet. And I would use products in addition to what I just spoke about, such as the uh, Hist Pro and the immunity protocol. So that's what I would personally do. That's where I would start with. And you can certainly work with one of our health coaches, especially if you run that mold toxicity lab test too. All right. Great, great question. Uh, Ryan's up. Hi, Dr. Ball. I donated blood through the American Red Cross on December 2nd. And before taking my blood, they checked my pulse and my blood pressure. My pulse is in the low 90s and blood pressure was 140 over 70. After knowing these numbers, I started taking garlic and quercetin to help lower my blood pressure. I recently donated again on the 29th and my blood pressure went down to 118 over 72, which is awesome. But my pulse is in the mid 90s. Would my pulse stay high? When my blood pressure drops, why would my pulse stay high when my blood pressure drops so much? I thought there was a correlation between the two. How can I lower my heart, resting heart rate? I'm also a competitive bodybuilder, so I eat clean and weight train five to six times a week. Thank you for donating your valuable time to help with so many people. Thanks, Ryan. Appreciate it. Happy to help. So uh, there can, not always, there can be a correlation between blood pressure and pulse. But you can have a high pulse, beats per minute, and normal to lower blood pressure. You can also have higher blood pressure and a normal pulse. So ideal pulse for most people is in the mid fifties to mid sixties. Ideally, you don't want it in the seventies or above. It just means that there's a stressor on the body and you want your blood pressure about 120 over 80. Now I have a question for you, Ryan, because you may not have needed all of the garlic and all of those things, not that they're bad, those are great anyways, but you might have only had high blood pressure and a high pulse because you were a little bit nervous before giving blood. It's what we call white coat syndrome, meaning your blood pressure is typically normal. However, when a doctor goes to take it or nurse, your blood pressure shoots up. 
because you're worried that it might be high in the first place. So that's what you're worried about. There's an easy way to uh, check this. I've got a podcast on how to create your own doctor's office. And I give you recommendations on purchasing your own blood pressure monitor for home and your own oximeter, which takes your oxygen levels and your pulse. So you can just check it during the day to see if it's always high. Um, and then if it's always high, well, if your pulse is high you, all the time, if it's always the 90s, you're looking at some type of stressor on the body. Gut-based issues, inflammation, heavy metals, oxidative stress, um, sympathetic nervous system dominance, dysautonomia, like there's issues. And again, you can figure it out, right? I talk about that in the rain barrel effect. Uh, you're able to figure it out, but you just want to know why. And I would run the big five labs for sure if you're if it's true that your pulse is always high, not just before getting your blood pressure or blood taken. So again, um, you can find that podcast, How to Create Your Own Doctor's Office, or simply go to stephencabral.com forward slash resources, and you can just get the oximeter and the uh, blood pressure monitor that I recommend. Okay, last one today is from Simon. And Simon is saying, hello, Dr. C. Thanks, as always, for your wisdom. I was wondering if there were any health downsides to eating slightly spoiled or moldy food, such as brown fruit or bread where you remove the, remove the mold. There is so much written these days about the effect of mold toxins in both food and the environment, and I was wondering whether the same thing applied to fresh food that is past its prime. Great question, and the answer is that when a piece of bread or whatever, you know, a pastry, whatever, whatever you want to refer to, um, or even fruit has mold on it that is visible to the eye. There is most likely mold growing in other places or the mold could have brushed off very easily because it's very, very light in nature and landed on another piece that's more microscopic to the eye. So my recommendation is for moldy bread and moldy anything that you can see mold, hummus, etc., to be thrown away, okay? Definitely throw it away. It's not worth it because mold is such an immunosuppressant, like we spoke about earlier today, causes such inflammatory issues, uh, not a good thing, okay? But if it's a apple that has a little soft spot on it, I don't, that's not mold, right? That is what happens is the apple was uh, bruised, it was hit against something, and the cells started to open up, break down, the enzymes started to break down the fruit. That can just be cut away. So I don't have a problem with getting an apple with a little dent on it. Just cut that away so that you're not eating the brown spot. Um, and even eating the brown spot is not super detrimental, not like it is. Uh, it is rotting, the fruit, the fruit is rotting, but it's not the same as that mold that's built up, all right? So hopefully that was helpful. Great questions today. I will be back tomorrow answering more of your questions uh, on episode 1871 of our Cabral House Calls. Take care, have an amazing rest of the weekend.